Okay, just a little introductory. Yes. Um, we're here at the, what is the name of this place again? The, it's the African American Railroad Experience located at the Gold Coast Railroad Museum, Miami, Florida. What is the address here? It's Tom Carnage, you would ask me that. All right, that's okay, but we are adjacent. We're adjacent to the Metropolitan Zoo. The, and Miami Zoo, Metropolitan Zoo. Right. In, and uh, In Miami, Florida. Is that what city this is? Yeah, this it's is still, still Miami. Miami. It's just South Miami. Gotcha. Southwest kind of. Yeah, South, yeah, or Southwest, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. And uh, what is, um, mm -hmm. my name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the executive director for the Children's Coalition Incorporated. Okay. And um, this says, okay. Sir, what is your name? I'm Alan Laird. Right. And Mr. Laird, what, what is your birthday? Uh, December 8th, 1949. And what is, uh, what is your current address? My current address is 11301 Southwest 238th Street, Homestead, Florida, 33032. Great, great, okay. And uh, this place is really fascinating here. There's a, there's a, there's a ton of history, um, and uh, this is going to be on the back of your back. I don't know, I might put it, chop it up and put it in the middle in, sure. <laughs> in segments. But anyway, way. you'll see it. Yeah. You'll see it. At any rate, um, Okay, so it's just you and I attending the interview, and um, what branch of the service were you in? I was in the United States Coast Guard. Okay, and when did you serve? I, had to ser I served from uh, September 1968 to February uh, 1971. Okay, and um, where? Where did you serve? I, I served primarily aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Icebreaker West Wind, mm -hmm. WAGV 281. Okay. And um, uh, where did you, where were you living at the time you went into service? Uh, I, I enlisted in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. and did my training in the uh, training uh, center of uh, Alameda, California. Okay. And then I went to school in uh, a special uh, storekeeper school in New York at Governor's Island in New York. And then was transferred on, assigned to the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter West Wind. Right. Which was an icebreaker that uh, operated out of Curtis Bay, Maryland, and did the uh, North Pole, South Pole, and Great Lakes trips. Okay. Okay. Now, so let's back up for a minute. So you were living where? When uh, you first went in? Uh, Oakland, California. Is that where you were born? That's my birthplace. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What were you doing at the time, uh, before, just before you enlisted? Well, I was in high school, mm -hmm. and there was the heat of the Vietnam War, and I, I was holding on to a 1A uh, status draft card. And I decided that I wanted to serve, but I wanted to serve in a different way, and I, I joined the U.S. Coast Guard. Okay. Uh-huh. Why did you choose the Coast Guard? Why? Why? Well, it, it, it was it was different. It was unique, and they did a. And the, the words always uh, that jumped out at me is life saving. And yeah. and and service, and and that's what I like to do. And so I, I was going to make a career of the Coast Guard. Okay. Even though the Coast Guard, you mentioned Coast Guard, but they 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 did a lot of operations in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, uh, on the Ron One, and. And so they have been every, in every battle, even the landing on normally was done, operated the coxswains with Coast Guardsmen on the landing craft. So it's, uh, they have an extensive history back to the revenue cutter service uh, when they were used to intercept slave ships and what have you. Mm -hmm. So I've always had an interest in that. Uh huh. Okay, okay. Um, all right, well, you said you. You went in and you signed up in, in California? Yes. In Oakland? Yes. All right. And then you, where'd you go? Well, we went to directly into training. And, uh, where? They had a training facility right there near Oakland at oh. Alameda uh, Coast Guard Station. Right. Uh, training Center uh -huh. on, on Government Island. Uh huh. How long was that training? That training was 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was just basic training, right? It was basic training, but they, they, they put a lot of. Um, Emphasis. emphasis on uh, 
operating under pr extreme pressure uh -huh. because uh, it's very dangerous when you're out at sea or when you're out doing a rescue or if you're in, in a combat situation. So it was a lot of, it was very challenging mentally, physically, uh, you know, and spiritually. <laughs> but uh, I came through. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I heard you say spiritually. Um, what were you, what do you, what were your training instructors like? Uh, during that time, the training instru instructors. It was the '60s, and uh, I came into the that first day on forming company with a, a large afro, which didn't sit well with the training instructors, <laughs> and so uh, from then on. I was getting beat up with an apple, even though my head was clean as an egg, you know. Yeah. And so uh, uh, they said, we don't like your principles, and I didn't even know what principles were. <laughs> Here comes the, the, uh, the mental conditioning. I yes, think. yes. I so they, at, at one time they had me uh, uh, lay in my rack at night for 15 minutes, get up for 15 minutes and stand on the head go back to my rack, sleep 15 minutes, go back to the head, stand 15 minutes, you know. Yeah. But you, you were insured never to wet in the bed, you know. <laughs> yeah, he took <like>, okay. <laughs> All right, um, uh, okay, so, <clears throat> I'm taking there was a lot of physical training? A lot of physical training. And also mental conditioning, mental obviously. Condition, yeah. How was the food? Food was excellent. Uh -huh. The food was, Excellent. Okay. Uh, in fact, and when I went to New York, it was just super. Excellent. Even better, huh? Oh, because we had the commissary school there. Where were you stationed in New York? Uh, gov gov uh, Governor's Island, there in the in the bay, in the uh, in, um, right there in the harbor of New York. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. right across. You know, I could, you know, we had our own ferry that ran across between gov Governor's Island mm -hmm. and Manhattan. Okay. Um, uh, were you um? Did, before you went to New York, did you go on leave? Did you go home? Uh, did you go home? Yes, went home for a short bit. How'd you get to New York? Did you fly? Fly. Okay. As first, my first time on an on an airplane. Wow. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you you flew to New York. You're Governor's Island. How many weeks were you there? Uh, it was about sixteen weeks. Okay. Four train. months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was your training there? Uh, finance and supply. Okay, that was your. That was my, you know, MOS. MOS, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that I was a storekeeper. Okay, supplies, huh? Yes. What was the first supply? That's interesting. We're, and we're right next to the An rail operating room. train. Right at the zoo. At uh, yeah, at the, the the operating train out here at Gold Coast. Uh -huh. And this week they're doing Thomas the Train, so we have. Uh, thousands of people here visiting, right. riding Thomas the train. Okay, okay. So you'll hear the you'll hear Thomas blow its stack now and then from at the intervals. Whistles. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Um. All right. Where were we? We were um. We we're, we're Governor's in, Island. Yeah. Finance. Yes. Is it counting? Accounting. Yeah, accounting. Uh, the whole realm of finance because the storekeeper, especially aboard ship, handled everything <coughs> from. Uh, uh, Handling the, the engineers' oil tests, uh, requisitioning items, uh, all the commissary items aboard a ship, foul weather clothing, right. all these things. It managed everything that a ship would need. And also, uh, we were the, if someone happened to go to the brig, we were the keepers of the brig. Oh, really? Yes. Huh. So you, were, you had a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility. Okay. So you, you trained for 16 weeks. Uh, the food was good. Excellent. Uh, did you get to go on leave on the weekends? Oh yes, every weekend uh, uh, it was like uh, like a special spirit that caused a lot of us to swoop into Harlem and hang out on 125th Street at the Baby Grand uh, Club, also Small's Paradise. We would go to a various sundry after hour joints uh. and then we'd finish up at Wells uh, fried chicken <laughs> on Lenox Avenue. Okay. And on Sundays, because they didn't sell hot liquor, we wind up with a bottle of wine at Central Park. Okay. 
All right. Okay, so I was, I was wondering, what a, did you experience New York or yes. just Harlem? Or uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, not. Ha Harlem, uh, but also different areas of New York, but we were, you could always possibly find us hanging on the, the boulevards of Harlem. Okay. And, you know, going to the Apollo because you could see a movie, you could see a live show. Right. And, I mean, it didn't cost Harlem anything. Right. You know, and uh, just soak in the spirit of watching people, you know, traverse the streets and and uh, uh, going over to get a, uh, a deep fried fish sandwich. <laughs> I mean, it was good things there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the women were uh, 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 very interesting. Okay. All right, maybe we need to leave New York. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> so you were there for 16 weeks. Yeah. So you've been trained. Yes. Where did you go after? Uh... And then I went uh, back home for leave. Okay. And then I would report it to my first ship of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Westman, an icebreaker. Uh -huh. And I arrived in from California into Baltimore. Uh, and uh, with my, uh, then during those times we wore our Donald Duck uh, sailor hats. And, uh, and I came into the Curtis Bay shipyard and walked up to this giant white ship. And I said, this is where I'm going to be. And I came aboard and I said, well, where's my room? <laughs> they said, there's no room. But we did have night uh, berthing for the storekeepers and commissary uh, and stewards. So it was, very, it was a very accommodating uh, uh, facility. And where was this? On the, on the West Wind. On the, on that the was on the, on the ship? Yes. Icebreaker. Yes. And what coast was that? Uh, East Coast. Okay. Did you go? Where'd you go? We went out of uh, Curtis Bay. You you had you went out of where? Uh, Curtis Bay, Maryland, uh -huh. right outside of Baltimore. Oh, and go into the Chesapeake, and we'd go to uh, one trip was to go out to stop at Norfolk, and then we head up north to the North Atlantic, uh -huh. uh, past Nova Scotia, and into uh, the lock system of uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. Mm. And we'd go through the whole entire locking systems, Eisenhower locks, all, until we reached the Great Lakes. Right. And there, the, a lot of the ships were stranded because the, the lake was frozen. Mm -hmm. And when the last door opened and the locks opened up, and it was just thick sheets of ice, and we, we were able to rise up and break through and free up some ships. And what time that, of the year was that? Uh, it was, it really was just before spring. Yeah, just before spring. So you just at the end of winter. Yeah, mm. and it was, you know, so it was still, and and then people welcomed us. I mean, the helicopters came out and greeted us, and the people, and, and it was an exciting thing for us to come through, I guess. And then we go into the different lakes and do the same thing. Right. Uh, so it was it was it was a nice experience and a very picturesque, ex uh, you know, experience. Uh, the other trips, uh, the ship would go up to. Uh, Tule Greenland and Reykjavik, Iceland, uh -huh. up to North Pole, and then down to South Pole to the McMurdo Sound, uh, to McMurdo Station, and resupply it with supplies and bring scientists down and bring back, uh, you know, uh, uh, research material and things. So, uh, but that was, uh, you know, that I, I enjoyed the Coast Guard, and, uh, and, and that's why when I... Uh, I was injured. It was uh, such a tra trauma for me because I felt like my part of my life was uh, no more. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so, you, over the three year period, you just traveled up and down the eastern seaboard? Yes. Okay. And then also, uh, like I said, I didn't make, I was injured, I didn't make the north trip uh -huh. to the North Pole or the south trip. You did or didn't? I didn't. I thought because you did. Because I, I, got, I got injured at the point when we were getting ready to make that deployment, uh -huh. Operation Deep Freeze. But, but you had at one time made those trips, right? Well, I didn't make the trip to north, only the Great Lakes. Oh. We would go out to Great Lakes and then we would do other type of patrol things. Okay. Uh, and then our, uh, our, our ship was in port a long time because uh, we weren't calling the service until conditions were where we had to go up and do work. So, 
um, free the waterways. Where were you? Where were you in port for that lengthy period? Of uh, Curtis Bay, Baltimore. Uh -huh. In fact, it, it was so often it felt like I had a civilian job because <laughs> I would go into Baltimore all the time, and and we'd come back and forth, and uh, and had a great group of uh, uh, shipmates. You know that we all bonded. Okay, we're going to get to that. I just want to get some more clarity. So the furthest that you traveled. In during when you were or the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Great Lakes. Okay, that's north. That's north. And the further south, uh, the uh, south was we never went further. I never made it further than uh, Norfolk, where we would go in Virginia. Virginia, gotcha. All right. So you were and you say you were stationed in, in Baltimore for how long? How long were you at port? Uh, what we were, we were I was stationed there about two years. Right. Okay. So what did you do while you were there? Well, I, I and the ship is still a it's a it's a city in itself, so it still needs all the things that. It, How big was that ship? Well, uh, it was you know, of course, I didn't have a very large ship, but I think I guess it was a uh, two hundred plus feet. Okay, long. Yeah. Okay. And and but it had a wide berth, berth, uh -huh. because we, you know, we had special hulls uh, that allow us to break through the ice. Right. What was that? What was that all about? Can you describe some of that? The the the, the machinery or the mechanics of, of ice breaking? Yeah, well, we we would ride into. We could see the ice flows a lot of times when we we're going north. Mm -hmm. And then when we get into an area such as when we came to the locks, mm -hmm. well, the ship was able to ride above uh, the the ice yep. with its weight and break. Uh -huh. We had special engines right. that rock. Could rock the ship. Uh huh. Us, we had a, a round hull. Okay. And so we could kind of wiggle, wobble through the ice. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, you, you know, you you almost had to put seat belts on when we were uh, breaking through ice because <laughs> it would kind of throw you. <laughs> right. You know. Right. Yeah. And uh, and uh, of course, you know, in my in my first trip up, I, I know I, I fell prey to the the whole gags that they did because I was storekeeper and I would also get the mail and they said uh, uh, you had a report on deck to get up to ma get mail from the mail buoy uh -huh. Uh -huh. and I, I went for it because there's no way in the world they're gonna deposit mail on a buoy out in the middle of the ocean right okay but I went up ready to do my job uh -huh. <laughs> okay um, let's see let's see um so, I take it you got on. How'd you deal with your um, your peers, officers? How'd you get along with them? It was it was it was it was well. You know, I, I learned a lot from the different officers, and uh, uh, we were a community. We, it, I remember one of our deployments. It, it was like a John Wayne movie because our captain came down, and we were on the flight deck. And it was, it was uh, still dark, early morning, and we were getting ready to pull out. But it was such a feeling uh, of, uh, he came down and he gave this speech to us, and, uh, and then we were all fired up, ready to go to be deployed. And, and uh, it was something, I enjoyed that spirit, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and it made you felt that you were doing something important, right, and, uh, and, and it had value. I, so I, the, it was it was a good. I didn't have any uh, problems with uh, any of the personnel, really. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Um, I know you said you had an accident. Yes. We'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, what about your your um? Were there any casualties besides yourself in, in yeah, the unit? Yeah, it was job a, related. Yeah. Well, it was uh, it was a strange uh, circumstance because we had just came in off of a trip, and it was, I remember it was thick. Steak day, which is a Thursday, and we were all sitting at on our in the mess hall on the ship, having steak. Right. And uh, a guy, a shipmate, Alvin Franks, he was telling us that uh, Gene Dixon had predicted our ship would sink in the next North trip. Okay. And he said, uh, and and he said, you know, I'm I'm not going to make that trip. And okay. and it just seemed so natural. And uh, and I said. Well, you're not going, I'm not going either. And we didn't know how we were not going to go. But <laughs> And then another guy uh, we called Fast Talking Willie, he said, well, I am not going either. <laughs> and the strangest thing, the uh, it was a Memorial Day weekend, I believe. 
And Frank Alvin went home to Kansas, uh, left the ship, and we all went into town. But we always would make contact back to the ship. It was just a connection we had, just to see what was going on, even right. though we were all on liberty. Uh -huh. And they told us that Alvin was killed uh, in a car accident as a passenger coming back from the airport, and his neck was broken. Wow. And uh, it was traumatic for us because we were all so close, and I had to be the one to assemble all of his personal effects, and and then we, our shipmate went to the, to the funeral. Uh -huh. uh, after Alvin's funeral, uh, it was when I got injured, and I was in a vehicle riding back to the ship, uh -huh. and the ship uh, overturned, and it threw me out of the back seat, and I hit What overturned? The vehicle. Okay. And, and it threw me out, uh, and I can already say what, what, what my, my shipmates who were in the car said. I went out, out the back seat, and while I was flying in the air, I, I guess hit the telephone pole, and then crashed down onto the pavement. And, uh, and the car turned over, but no one really got hurt other than a, a bloody nose. And a, a, but I was there laying out in the streets, and, and the police had pronounced me dead. And uh, the fire department came and was able to resuscitate me. And uh, I, I, I woke up four days later uh, coming out of a coma, uh, not knowing what had happened. Okay. So it had crushed my skull and, uh, and did a lot of damage. I was paralyzed for a while and I lost a, uh, the optic nerve of my left eye and some hearing loss. Mm. And then my face was... Uh, torn off. Uh, they thought they were going to have to give me plastic surgery, but it, it, somehow it got healed. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, besides that, yes. Tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. Uh, uh, in the Coast Guard? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it was. Um, It was very, for me, I love history. And so being on Governor's Island in New York, I, all, I walked around discovering, especially when I had to do guard duty late at night, walking through the old rickety rafters. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but I, I found so much history there because it went back to uh, 17th, uh, uh, I mean the 18th century. Uh -huh. And so you see all of the, the buildings and the history, you could almost hear voices. Right. And you know, a lot of history came off that island. A lot of decisions were made, and there used to be an army fort at one time right. also. So, I take it you're a history buff. I love history. I see. Keep going. And so uh, uh, I would just, it, it, it's like every day was a new discovery with something. And, and, I, and my, 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 my hunger for history always grew and my, my, I would study Coast Guard history or the Revenue Cutter, Cutter Service or, or, or would, uh, uh, we would go out, um, a lot of times we had to perform duties as uh, uh, in the harbor by uh, uh, posting aboard uh, foreign vessels and, and, and providing security uh, of, uh, of the, the mar mariners coming off and on the ship and checking their uh, identifications and doing those types of things. That was interesting. It was, again, it felt like you were doing some type of service. Uh, this is before Homeland Security. But okay. uh, uh, it, it was a lot of memorable. And just the... the, the sorry. All right. Picked it up again in the middle. I'm sorry. Okay. And the things we saw while cruising the the, the, the oceans, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 the, uh, the life, the birds, the the dolphins and the whales mm -hmm. and all those things. It was it was like endless water, right? Uh, and, and then to come into places like Nova Scotia, and and to see the difference in terrain and and the beauty of the St. Lawrence Seaway or the Sandwich, uh, the uh, the islands up in upstate New York. Um, it was great. Okay. You really enjoyed being. I did. In the uh, in the service, didn't you? Yeah. I, in fact, I still go back to the Coast Guard base, you know, 
And uh, 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 there's one out here, and I, I'll go out just to uh, the smell, the smells of, of ships and uh, the sea, uh, the, the young men and women doing their service. And I get joy by saying hello to them because I appreciate the service that they're doing and the military are doing. Gotcha. Did you receive any um, awards, medals, citations? No, only one was the National Defense during the time of the Vietnam conflict. Okay. And... Uh, and, uh, and that's about what well, that's about as far as uh, those types of things. So. How did you stay in touch with your family over the over the three year period? Through letters, okay, and uh, uh, writing. But uh, and then when I was you know, able to get some leave to go home and and be with my uh, family for for a, a brief time, and then to go back on a new adventure. Okay, you know, and the military did help uh, develop me into. A level of maturity that allowed me to take on new things once, you know, in my life I didn't know would happen. We're going to cover that. That's going to, that's in a question, but before we get to that, tell me all the places, even while you were on leave, that you traveled while you were in the military. Well, I traveled to uh, the lot. New ones, because I... Yeah, I went to, would go out to, uh, we would go to Philadelphia. A lot of our shipmates lived in different things, Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, we go to their homes, everyone's uh -huh. home, and they were all from the East Coast. Okay. And so it would be um, Atlantic City, Pleasantville, uh, Philly, uh, and uh, New York, uh, or what have you. And it was all local right there in, uh, in Washington, D.C., right. Baltimore, Maryland, uh -huh. those, uh, those types of things. And, and that was the extent of it for uh, my time in the service. Have you maintained any of those friendships? I did make contact with one a shipmate that I found on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, we would just exchange uh, pleasantries, but uh, and I see some things come back and forth. I was hoping you always hope that hey, you found an old shipmate, and let's revisit some of those times. Right. You know? But it wasn't that didn't happen. So uh -huh. you know, I guess I always feel a loss uh, since I was in my career uh, uh, was interrupted Intro, yeah. quickly. Yeah, you know, and so I always have this longing. You know, I used to have dreams that they called me back in for service. You know, and it's strange. You know, and I'm trying to get prepared. You know, yeah, you know, but it never happens. You gotcha. Know? Become battle ready, huh? Yeah, I understand. Um, okay, we discussed your injuries. Stay in touch with the family. I take it, well, you were in supplies, so you always had everything that you needed, right? I had everything I needed and everything everyone else needed, <laughs> which was a good thing. <laughs> okay. Did you feel a lot of pressure and stress? Uh, not from that. You no, were just trained in it. It was trained in it, and, and you, 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 you feel confident in it. We, you know, we were the paymasters. We right. would we'd have to be, take, you know, a, a group of us along very well with all my shipmates and, and uh, of course, uh, on the weekends. Uh, I had the keys to all the commissary goods, and on the weekends we opened the gallery, galley, for uh, uh, like a brunch, so everyone could have steaks or whatever they wanted to have, you know. Right. So I was quite popular, especially with the foul weather gear. <laughs> when we were heading north, everyone wanted uh, all the foul weather gear they could get. <laughs> okay. What was a way to make friends? Huh? Yeah, already made friends. <laughs> gotcha. Um, did you keep a diary? You know, I did have some journals, but uh, uh, all of my papers and some of the artifacts of things I collected while I was uh, on board the ship, it came up missing. Wow. Uh, even cameras and uh, uh, film and things that I had taken pictures of, the, you know, uh, different places. Uh -huh. uh, it was nothing. Somehow, whoever took the inventory or something, somebody raided my locker or something. And, wow. and so I didn't, I always missed that, you know. Mm -hmm. So, did you did you separate from the service right after the accident? Uh, no, I was in for uh, several months under uh, under uh, disability conditions. Okay. You know, I was uh, unable to perform duties, but I was assigned to uh, the land. You were assigned where? Uh, to the land base in Curtis Bay. Okay. Uh, as the master of arms at, at one of the barracks. Mm -hmm. 
What rank were you when you separated? I, 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 I was just about to, I finished all my work for E5. Oh, wow. And, and, uh, and all I, I was ready to, you know, complete everything, and the accident happened. And I mean, I, and I was already E4. Yeah. And when I got out of school, I got my, you know, third class petty officer. But, uh, so that, that was always a missing thing, you know, that right. uh, I didn't, after doing all the work, I never received my E5. You got know. you. Got you. Um, okay. Um, it's a very interesting story. Um, okay, so you were in Baltimore when you had the accident? Yes. Okay. So anyway, you're getting ready to separate. So what do you, what do you, you get, you, you know you got your disability, right? Right. I, so what are you thinking about? What's going through your mind? Well, you know, being, being so young uh, and knowing that my world had abruptly changed, mm -hmm. I went into a deep depression for a while. Uh -huh. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and with the loss of my eye, not being able to see out of it again, I knew I could no longer do things like play tennis or baseball and things because the, I couldn't see the ball. You know my range of vision, and also a special scar injury on my right eye. That, uh -huh. uh, in fact, they took me to John Hopkins Hospital because it was so interesting to them. They they had filmed it, but uh, I and my my vision was impaired and my hearing was impaired, and I, I went into depression. So when I headed back home, uh, I just felt lost for a while, and then I. Uh, Got a job working for the Department of the Navy as uh, uh, again in uh, uh, supply and clerking uh, for the, as civil service clerk G4 right. uh -huh. on the Naval Supply Center in Oakland. And uh, through there, I, I worked my way up to uh, where I became uh, in, in nine, the, the nine years that I worked for them. Uh, we started our first. Uh, data processing, a little entity for, I worked for uh, MISPAC, Military Sealift Command. And, uh, now you're a civilian now? You're still in the military? I'm now a civilian, okay. but I'm working, and I guess working on, uh, uh, for the Navy kept me to the feeling that I was still connected. Right, so this is a GS job. Oh uh, yeah, GS4, yeah. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And I became GS5, and I, I, I helped implement a lot of, uh, this is when telecommunications was coming in the, about, and so I was able to do some, uh, complete some challenging things. And I don't even know how it happened, but it built my confidence up. Mm -hmm. And then I left uh, the Department of Navy and started working for the uh, commercial world uh, in telecommunication and uh, data process. Okay. Okay. And who did you do that for? I, I went to Wells Fargo Bank and then I became the network control manager for Wells Fargo Bank over all of their uh, branch teller systems, you know, that were connected via communications, and part of the and first and part of the first implementation of the ATM machines when they were first coming out. And then I went on to American President lines. I'm still with ships, and now I, I got involved with helps to uh, implement a, a new online network throughout the U.S. and Asia. And so uh, my, my job carried me to Asia quite a bit to help uh, put up uh, sites in the Philippines, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and Korea. Okay. So I want to ask you. Okay, so your GI Bill. Yes. All right, alongside, I'm, I want to stay on track with this. Yes. With the career. Yes. But GI Bill, did you use it? Yeah, I did it. It was great. I went to school. That's how I got uh, my proficiency in uh, uh, data process and telecommunications, going to school, getting a, 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 a AA degree, and then I was working on a Bachelor of Science degree in telecommunications systems. And uh, great, great. so, so, and 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 without the GI Bill, that wouldn't have been a possibility uh, for me to, because I was I was I was working, and had started a young family, and. Uh, and uh, sometimes I would be so tired, but knowing that I was giving, was given this gift of the GI Bill, it motivated me to, to perform again, you know, to keep w going to school at night and working in the daytime until I got my degree. Right. Mm. Okay. All right, so um, 
You finish your degree. Yes. In in computer science. Computer science and telecommunications. Right. So. And then I, I then I was focused more so because the projects became quite challenging with a new a lot of new technology and I was involved with a lot of new technologies being developed mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and to to manage our commerce between we had railroads, uh, ships, and trucking companies, American uh, president companies, right, all over the world and and so. Uh, and also, I was involved with uh, managing their, their uh, electronic messaging system, which was all at one time teletype. Right. And we migrated into electronic mail systems. So uh, all of that stuff was, and which was really leading edge because that wasn't at the basic consumer level at that time. Right. Okay. And so my my career uh, went on, uh, uh, and it was good. Uh, but then, I guess it was this, the condition of my post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> that started becoming a heavy burden. Mm -hmm. And I became very depressed. I was unable to work again. Right. And uh, uh, I went on a disability. And, uh, and I felt lost again. And for some reason, I, I got a brochure about... Uh, the Pacific School of, the, of Religion, which is a university-based uh, graduate theological unit in Berkeley. And I said, I went to their uh, little uh, presentation and I, I said, I don't even know how I could pay for this graduate school, mm -hmm. get a master's degree. And all of a sudden I, I won a fellowship that I didn't know anything about. I didn't even know I, had, I didn't even apply for it. Right. And my way was made, and I wound up in graduate school, working on my Master's Divinity. And so I graduated with a Master's Divinity and, and became a minister in the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church uh -huh. for a long time. And, and I worked as an I became an artist. That, that was just something that popped out. And so I went off from there, and my art started. I kept producing art, and then I opened up an art gallery and did outreach with the community in Oakland. And I worked with uh, inmates at San Quentin and Death Row and, mm -hmm. and uh, other prisons across the country. And I was asked to go, families would come and say, my child has been in a Mexican prison for eight years. Would you go down and check? And I would go through, get clearances, mm -hmm. bring them food and things. So I started working as an advocate to, for the prisons and prisons families and children. Wow. And doing children therapeutic art classes. And I even substitute teach. Uh, did some substitute teaching. What kind of art? Drawing? What? All, all my paintings, all these paintings are done by me. That, oh, that really? See. Yeah. So I, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I do uh, paintings and, and all the little sculptures, and that's how I design the sets. Uh, so I, 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 I started getting an issue with my painting and my art. And uh, in Oakland, they, you know, they did a television <coughs> program with mm -hmm. some of the things I did, and, and uh, 60 Minutes came out and, and well, because I was involved with some death row inmates and things. and So I, I was involved with that advocacy and it became more of my outreach, reaching out, reaching out to the schools. I, I'd have programs that the school children would come down to the gallery and we had some that would work down there. Uh, we would also get assigned people from the court. One of the judge, Judge Wheatley in right. Oakland, would assign some of his visitors <laughs> to the court. Uh, as part of their uh, 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 sentence would have to come and write a survey of the art gallery and the history that they saw. Okay. So, uh, so I got involved primarily with, you know, doing more outreach to communities. And then uh, in 2005, I closed my art gallery. I needed it, uh, just to do a change and join the American uh, AmeriCorps Vista. Right. And uh, I went in for three years of service. So now I'm back in service again. And I came to Miami to work with the prison reentry and, and homelessness situation. And that's what you're doing now? And, and I did that for three years. Okay. And I remained here uh, in, in Florida uh, and kept doing art and uh, doing my collections and doing outreach in the community, uh, uh, inner city art programs, what have you. Mm -hmm. And giving what I could because I was on disability, you know. And uh, and then I started collecting these artifacts. Uh, I didn't have a car for five years because all my money went into artifacts. I had a wagon I would pull. 
Right. And, and people say, you're crazy. You, you spend all your money on collecting. I said, because I want to give back to the community uh, this lost history, this lost treasure. Right. And uh, I started coming out to the Gold Coast Railroad Museum, and uh, they had, I would paint out here in, in the, uh, underneath the trains, uh, or the overhead. And they offered me a place to put, set up an exhibit. Mm -hmm. And that's how all of this exhibit grew out of that me coming out. It would take me five hours to get out here on a bus and five, uh, four or five hours to get home on the bus. But I did it every Saturday. Who were you traveling from too? Uh, from North Miami Beach, but via the bus, city bus. Yeah. And then on, and, and on holiday and weekends, the bus ran slower, you know, you had to so wait. So you were coming from, from North Miami Beach to here? Yes. And it took that long? Yeah, because uh, some of the buses you had to wait uh, 30 minutes for, and you'd connect to the metro rail, and I had to wait about 40 minutes for another bus to get down here, then I get dropped off outside and then walk in. Yeah. And uh, uh, but I just continued to do it, and they offered me this spot to to bring these artifacts alive, and so I started doing this uh, and um, providing a venue for the school systems and other people to come through, and I give tours and tell the history, uh -huh. and that's what I do today. You know, primarily I do my art, and I do outreach, and I and I do uh, uh, research and recovery of historical artifacts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to to take a lot of my artifacts and and donate it to a uh, to help a youth group come together in a community to inspire them to set up uh, uh, their own uh, museum and so that they would be inspired to research and learn how to research and find these hidden treasures and just to give them inspiration and give them some some uh, uh, respect for the history you know, respect for humankind, and uh, to have it all come together, you know, and, and that would give me joy. Okay. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, you belong to any veterans organizations? Uh, the, I belong to the DAV. Okay. And, uh, and then I joined also uh, an organization, I, I paid the dues, it was for the African American Veterans Association or something like that and I never got any certificate or anything back anything and uh, and then I wrote to them I never heard anything back so I just say I guess so but I I, I, I feel a kinship to all military mm -hmm. you know if I see a young military person walking or in a, a, a place doing something, I, and I, I always try to commend them right. and inspire them because to let them know that they, their service is important. Mm -hmm. um, one more time. Did your, did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes, especially at being a member of the Coast Guard because a lot of the focus was on life saving and, uh, and about duty to humanity. Uh -huh. You know, and being there, you know, our model, Semper Paratus, always ready. Those things stuck with me, even as I do the things I do today. It's about having responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. Those values I learned in that experience, that military experience. And uh, so it, it was very instrumental in all the things, and even the tenacity to keep going when all, all odds are against you, to keep pushing. You know, to keep the vision alive. Right. When everything is against you, that that uh, that uh, training, and uh, early training, uh, the boot camp training, and all that proved that I could go farther than I thought I could go. Right. And that was important. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, today it it helps me with insight. Uh, even today, with the wars we have, and my my empathy for those who serve and they come home and there's nothing there sometimes but emptiness that 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 makes me sad because uh, if I had my way I'd have a brass band down there every time the plane land landed because people just don't understand what it is sometimes to do service to put your life on the line uh, for 60 seconds for 60 seconds and you're out there for many seconds, many hours, many days, you know, uh, under adverse condition. Okay. 
All right, well, is there anything you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Well, I, I want to add that I appreciate the work that you're doing and the volunteerism that you do and all the things you do in your service uh, uh, as a veteran. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to spend the time with you today uh, for this interview. Well, I want to I want to thank you for a great interview and um, I want to thank you for your service. A great story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you, Mr. Pleasure meeting you. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good job.